Good morning, everyone. In today's video, I am tackling one of the most frequently asked questions I get here on my channel. And that is the question of fertilizer. Why, when, how much, and what kind? The answer to the fertilizer question is not quite as cut and dry as some folks might have you believe. And I struggled to keep this video to a reasonable length because there is a lot to this topic. But today I'm going to share some fertilizer basics, my personal approach, and some guidelines I live by when it comes to using fertilizer in the garden. So let's jump in. While I'm sure that many of you savvy gardeners are well aware of the information I'm about to share, it feels a bit remiss not to start off with a little basic information about fertilizer in general. Plants require at least 14 mineral elements for their nutrition, which are obtained from the soil, or in the case of depleted soils, from an exogenous fertilizer. There are the primary macronutrients, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, commonly referred to as NPK, and secondary macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. This group is coined macronutrients because of the relatively large amount that plants require. There are also trace elements or micronutrients required by plants in very small amounts, and these include boron, copper, chlorine, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. In the U.S., fertilizers are labeled with three numbers that indicate the guaranteed analysis or fertilizer grade. The three numbers give the percentage by weight of nitrogen, N, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. So as an example, I borrowed this from Clemson. If we're looking at this label of an 18410 fertilizer, if this fertilizer was in a 100-pound bag, then that would mean there are 18 pounds of nitrogen, 4 pounds of phosphate, and 10 pounds of potassium. The total has to add up to 100% or 100 pounds in this case, and that is made up of inert material. Typically, this is a nutrient carrier that aids in the application of the nutrients. A complete fertilizer contains all three primary macronutrients, and a balanced complete fertilizer is going to contain equal amounts of all three. Different types of plants require different levels of macro and micronutrients. Root crops, for example, generally fare better with a higher relative amount of phosphorus and potassium and a lower relative amount of nitrogen as compared to other crops, as excess nitrogen could lead to big lush top growth at the expense of root growth. Corn, on the other hand, is a notorious nitrogen hog. Legumes like peas and beans can actually fix their own nitrogen, and an application of excess exogenous nitrogen can reduce yields. Now, if you've watched some of my planting guide type videos, you'll often hear me suggest certain ratios of fertilizer for certain plants based on that plant's nutritional needs. But this is really a generalized recommendation. It's hard to hone in on specific fertilizer needs in anyone's garden without taking into account other factors first. So what are those factors? The first, and in my opinion, the most important is the soil itself. Knowing the specific levels of nutrients in your own soil is the key to optimally fertilizing your plants. Applying fertilizer before you know your soil's makeup and the nutrients that you need is basically a big waste of your time and your money. If your soil is already high in phosphorus and potassium, there is no need to be adding a fertilizer that is high in these elements to the soil. In fact, this can actually have a detrimental effect. For example, according to Texas A&M, the buildup of phosphorus in lawns, gardens, pastures, and croplands can cause plants to grow poorly and even die. Excessive soil phosphorus reduces the plant's ability to take up required micronutrients, particularly iron and zinc, even when soil tests show there are adequate amounts of these nutrients in the soil. Phosphorus has led to algal overgrowths in many large bodies of water due to fertilizer runoff. We've unfortunately seen a lot of this in agricultural areas of Ohio, with lakes becoming too unhealthy to fish from or swim in. Now, a good soil test will give you a range of measures about your soil, including all of those macro and micronutrients I mentioned earlier, the soil pH, the humus or organic matter percentage, as well as compare your numbers to an optimal range so you can see where your soil measures up. A great test 
We'll also give you recommendations on how to improve those areas where our soil doesn't fall into the ideal range. One of my favorite testing companies to use when starting with a brand new plot of soil is Kinsey Agricultural Services, as they give incredibly detailed recommendations for amending soil. I then like to do a maintenance test every couple of years to make sure I'm on the right track toward improving my levels. And for these maintenance tests, I really like the ease and convenience of RX soil testing. With RX Soil's testing process, they include everything I need. I just pop my soil sample in, mail it, and very quickly I can access my results online. Now I'm gonna pop two of my soil tests up on the screen here, one from RX Soil and one from Kinsey Agricultural Services. And you can see across both of these tests, my pH is a little high and some of my micronutrients definitely need boosting. Though, as I'll talk about a little later in the video, once I get that pH down a little, it may help with the bioavailability of some of those micros. Once I know where my soil stands, and honestly, even before I have those test results in my hands, my goal is to feed the soil, not the plants. The goal in my gardens is to minimize and hopefully eventually eliminate all use of exogenous fertilizer by building better soil. This is important because plants don't grow independently in a garden environment. They form relationships with other members of the soil web, including fungi, beneficial bacteria, nematodes, insects, and worms. Healthy soil is teeming with microscopic life, and these members of the soil community have some very important jobs. Microbes are essential for nutrient cycling, the exchange of organic and inorganic matter throughout an ecosystem, and help plants in a big way by breaking down bound nutrients and feeding them back to the plant roots. Microbes also help to break down organic matter in the soil, things like crop residue, leaf mulch, and grass clippings, and they release the nutrients locked up in the organic matter into usable forms for plants. Ultimately, if your soil microbiome is not healthy and robust, it will lack the microbial life to properly break down nutrients and assist plants with uptake. So how does one go about feeding the soil and building a healthy soil microbiome? I do this through a variety of tactics. While I'm not strictly no-dig, check out this video for why, I do try to minimize soil disruption as much as possible. My goal with new beds is for them to become essentially a no-dig area within two or three years of creation. I also avoid walking on beds or any unneeded compaction to my beds especially important when dealing with my heavy clay soil. So I create garden spaces with devoted walkways and slightly raised planting areas. Avoiding disruption and compaction of the soil is very important because in order to build a healthy soil microbiome, all of those wonderful microbes have to be left undisturbed in order to grow and flourish and build the networks that are needed. Every time that that soil is disrupted, turned over, tilled, you're essentially destroying a lot of the work that those microbes have done in building a healthy soil web up to that point. I also extensively utilize cover crops and green manures, as well as natural mulches like chopped leaves, grass clippings, alfalfa hay, and wood chips. I try to really mix it up with many types of organic matter additions and always aim to keep the soil surface covered. Keep in mind, the addition of organic matter is an ongoing process. It will improve your soil over time, but I still add generous helpings every single growing season, multiple times a season. In addition to diversifying my organic matter, I try to diversify the actual crops that I'm planting as much as possible within my garden as well. And I focus on the addition of beneficial, nutrient-rich soil amendments over fertilizers when possible. Manure and compost being two that I found to be the most helpful. These both help to provide plants with a boost of nutrition, and they feed soil microbes and attract things like earthworms. I don't find that bagged compost or manure from the garden store is as beneficial in this regard. It can still be helpful for improving soil structure and providing a little nutrition boost, but it's not microbially rich like the homemade or farm-made stuff is. Now, just an interesting little tidbit I found from the University of Maryland Extension. 
They say that soil organic matter releases plant available nutrients slowly during the growing season. Your reliance on organic or synthetic fertilizers will probably decrease as your organic matter content increases. We want to aim for a soil organic matter content of 5 to 10%. Soils in this range tend to be fertile, easy to work with, and have a large number of earthworms. But the extension also mentions that soil organic matter may not provide enough to keep up with nutrition demands during certain times of the season or at certain phases of plant development. For example, very early in the spring or when plants are getting ready to start ripening fruit. And I have found this to be the case, which is why I still rely on fertilizers to some extent. When opting for fertilizers, it is important to know who needs what, as in that example of the root crops versus the corn that I gave earlier, and to know your heavy feeders. Now, identifying those heavy feeders may be a bit frustrating at first because you may notice, like I did, that almost every source you look at gives a different categorization for different plants. For example, the University of Georgia lists corn as a medium feeder, whereas the University of Maryland lists it as a heavy feeder. But in general, heavy feeders are going to be those plants which have a higher nutrient uptake need and in general take longer to reach maturity. I tend to agree with Jean-Martin Fortier's pleasantly simplistic categorization in his book, The Market Gardener. He lists heavy feeders as those members of the cucurbit family, the solanaceous crops, some brassicas, onions, and garlic. Light feeders include root vegetables, mixed greens, and lettuce, and peas and beans receive no fertilizer. Now for a bit more detail on those heavy and light and medium feeders, the University of Maryland Extension has a good list. And I will link that in the video description information below as well. My general rule for feeding plants is this. For seeds started indoors, I start seedlings on a very low dose, all natural liquid fertilizer, added each time I water, after seedlings have their first set of true leaves and or are several inches tall. I use the same fertilizer for every type of seedling I start. I'm still testing out new formulations to find my favorite, but most of these natural liquid fertilizers are derived from things like molasses, fish emulsion, even composted liquefied food scraps. My homemade seed starting mix also has a little boost in the form of earthworm castings. When plants are ready to go out into the garden, I typically provide one helping of plant fertilizer at transplant time or when my direct sown seedlings are a few inches tall. Except for my very heavy feeders, I will rarely apply additional fertilizer later in the season unless my plants are showing me signs of deficiencies and this could show up as weak growth or yellowing leaves amongst other symptoms. So for alliums, I typically try to feed my garlic and onions two times in the spring, once in early spring when the greens start growing and once just as the bulbs really start to swell. Honestly though, some years I'm lucky to just get one feeding in. For brassicas, including broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and kohlrabi, I give them one dose of granular fertilizer at planting time. Same with my solanaceous crops, tomato, eggplant, and pepper. One dose of fertilizer at transplant time. Lettuce and other leafy greens like arugula, spinach, and mizuna. If I'm transplanting seedlings, I may give them a dose of fertilizer at transplant time, but often when I direct sow, I don't fertilize them at all. And with corn, I'll typically try to side dress with composted manure and or nitrogen heavy fertilizer when my corn is a foot or so tall. Corn is such a nitrogen hog that I often find it needs a second dose of nitrogen rich fertilizer mid season. Now for my cucurbits like cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, and squash, they also get one dose of fertilizer at transplant time. If I'm direct sowing, I try to remember to fertilize once the seedlings are up at about six inches tall. For my legumes like peas and beans, I personally don't feed these anymore. I find they do fine without additional fertilizer. I used to sometimes fertilize my peas when I was transplanting them, but I skip that step now. For direct sown root crops like carrots, beets, turnips, and parsnips, 
Again, I try to remember to side dress seedlings when they're a couple inches tall. I don't always remember and they still do okay. And I don't feed radishes at all. Now for my potatoes, I always add plenty of compost and composted manure to the planting area. I also typically try to give them a dose of fertilizer mid-season. For sweet potatoes, I typically mix a little fertilizer or compost into the planting area at planting time. And for perennial vegetables like asparagus and rhubarb, I add some granular fertilizer when I'm planting, and then I like to do a top dressing of compost or composted manure yearly. Now, in regard to the specific fertilizer that I use, I've had a lot of questions about the magic powder. <laughs> That was a bad idea, don't do that. That I use in a lot of my videos when I'm transplanting seedlings. I almost exclusively use Gardens Alive line of natural fertilizers. It's the line that I started gardening with and they've always worked really well for me. I like Gardens Alive's fertilizers because they are naturally derived using ingredients such as alfalfa meal, blood and bone meal, kelp meal, molasses, trace minerals, and humic acid and they have various formulas tailored towards specific garden plants. For example, they have formulations like tomatoes alive, root crops alive, and sweet corn alive. So it makes it really easy to know which fertilizer to pick for which plants if you're brand new to all of this. I don't have much personal experience with other brands of fertilizers. I have used the Espoma fertilizers, which have similar ingredients and a similar lineup to the Gardens Alive products, and I've had good results with those. And I've used Neptune's Harvest, which works really great, but most of those products are fish-derived and are quite stinky. They also tend sometimes to attract critters like raccoons because of the smell, so it's just something to be aware of. But they do work really well. Now, one further factor to consider when choosing fertilizer is the bioavailability of nutrients to plants. We want to make sure that the plants can efficiently uptake nutrients in the soil or the nutrients that we're providing with fertilizer. Or again, all of this is a waste of time and money. A great example of this, which many gardeners are familiar with, is the case of blossom end rot in tomatoes. BER is widely known as a calcium deficiency, but this isn't the full story. BER can occur even when there is sufficient calcium in the soil. It's more often an issue of insufficient calcium uptake on the part of the plant. Calcium is only moved into the plant with ample, consistent water supply. So if water is inconsistent, Either you're in a drought period or you get a whole ton of rain and then nothing at all. Tomato plants may not be able to uptake calcium effectively. BER may also occur in plants which have root damage or plants that are putting on new growth faster than the roots can uptake calcium, which is why it's not a great idea to over fertilize tomato plants, especially with nitrogen. Overall, plants' ability to uptake nutrients is a very complex topic, but I wanted to quickly share with you a few factors to consider. First off is soil pH. Most macronutrients are most readily available in soils with a pH level that's close to neutral, so about 6.0 to 7.0. Another reason that soil test is so important. However, it is a fine balance. Micronutrients like manganese, copper, zinc, and boron become inactivated in neutral to slightly alkaline soil and are readily available to plants in slightly acidic soil. Remember how earlier I mentioned my low micronutrient levels? My soil pH is definitely not helping that. My soil always wants to push toward the more alkaline side. In extremely acidic soils, so in the 4.0 to 5.0 range, some nutrients such as manganese and iron may be too readily available to plants and they end up taking too much of that nutrient up, often with toxic results. Acidic soil can also impede the activity of certain soil bacteria which assist in the breakdown of organic matter. As a result, you can end up with an accumulation of a lot of organic matter in the soil where the nutrients are still locked up and the plants can't access it. On the other hand, highly alkaline soils tend to bind up most nutrients, making them unavailable to plants. 
The second factor is a healthy soil microbiome. Again, I know I delved into this already when I talked about the need for healthy soil, but bacteria, fungi, and other beneficial microbes are critical for forming relationships with plants, which can help them more efficiently uptake nutrients. One of my favorite examples of this is with mycorrhizae. A mycorrhizal association occurs when a plant and the fungus have a mutually beneficial relationship where the fungus facilitates water and nutrient uptake in the plant and the plant provides food and nutrients created by photosynthesis to the fungus. Encouraging healthy symbiotic relationships like this and other relationships between soil microbes and plants to occur is an easy, and free way to help your plants more effectively uptake any fertilizer or any nutrients in the soil that might be available to them. Also consider soil water content. As in the case with the blossom end rot, the levels of moisture in the soil can affect the way that plants are able to uptake certain elements. In general, adequate soil moisture results in a more efficient uptake of nutrients by plant roots. Conversely, too much water can have the effect of washing out or diluting soil nutrient content. This is something that's commonly seen in very sandy soils as well as container plantings. Related to this is considering the choice between liquid versus granular fertilizer. Both forms do have their benefits, so it's important to consider your own garden conditions before choosing. As I just mentioned, nutrients can be more mobile with adequate moisture in the soil, and this is the case also with liquid fertilizer. Liquid fertilizer may make less mobile nutrients like phosphorus easier for plants to uptake than a granular version. Liquids also tend to be quite fast acting and make a good emergency fix for stressed plants. Foliar spray can be particularly effective. Granular fertilizers, however, tend to be longer lasting. This is why I can often apply one dose at transplanting time and it continues to provide for my plants for the entire season versus liquids which typically have to be applied more regularly throughout the season. Liquids can also be easier for immature root systems to uptake. This is a big reason I like to use the liquid fertilizers with my small indoor seedlings. So I know that was a lot to cover, and as you can tell, this is definitely not a cut and dry topic, but hopefully I've answered some of your questions about my own approach to fertilizer. But definitely, if you have questions that I did not answer in this video, drop a line in the comments below and let me know. And if you found today's video helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.